with that said, no more excuses. We'll look at our passage before us. Mark chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. Then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. So what we're doing, just to bring you up to speed, is we're looking at the last events of the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. Now, Jesus has just finished teaching in the temple. He had taken his men aside to teach them concerning faith-filled giving, and he did so as he observed a poor widow who was giving her gifts to the Lord. So after teaching them, they've left the temple. They're heading for the Mount of Olives, and that's where we pick up our story. Because it says in verse 1, as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. Now, as he's pointing out the temple, we need to know something of the history of Israel. We need to know that the temple during that day was a magnificent structure. It was incredibly beautiful. It was actually what is called the second temple because the first temple had been built under King Solomon. And Solomon's temple had been destroyed in 586. The Babylonians had overthrown Judah. They destroyed the temple. So after around 60 years in captivity, because they took them captive, and all Cyrus allowed the Jews to return. You see that in the Old Testament book of Ezra in chapter 1. So under Zerubbabel, they had laid the foundation for a second temple. Now, during the time of Jesus, the second temple had been going through re renovation. Herod the Great began to work on its beautification, and that work that he had begun had continued for many years. As a matter of fact, in the Gospel of John, in chapter 2, verse 20, Jesus has, is speaking with, with uh, the Jewish leaders and all, and he had said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. And uh, in response, the Jews said in John 2, 20, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. So they speak concerning the longevity of the construction. It had been going for some time, even though John adds a footnote to that and says he spoke concerning the temple of his body. But that tells us how long they had been working to beautify and restore and renovate this particular beautiful temple. And the disciples were overwhelmed with its beauty. Luke 21 verse 5 says some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts that had been dedicated to God. One commentator said it like this. He said, Herod's temple was one of the wonders of the ancient world, a beautiful building and a marvel of engineering. Josephus, who was an eyewitness of the temple, reported the exterior of the building lacked nothing that could astound either mind or eye. To approaching strangers, it appeared from a distance like a snow-clad mountain, for all that was not overlaid with gold was of purest white. And so even from a distance, they would see gold and the beautiful white stones in all of that beautiful temple. It was amazing. It was an amazing piece of architecture. And this, 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 this piece of architecture had amazed them. And that's why you see in verse 1, as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see, behold, what manner of stones, what buildings are here. And so they're amazed at it. It's magnificent. You see, some of the stones were 40 feet by 12 feet by 12 feet, and they weighed over 100 tons. 
They were quarried as a single piece and transported many miles to the building site to keep the sound of man's labor out of that area. It was adorned with beautiful stones and, and gifts. The gifts that are spoken of are, are those donations that were dedicated to the Lord. So the rich had given gifts of gold sculptors and gold plaques, other treasures, and, and these valuable gifts were displayed on the walls or suspended from the roof. And the disciples were overwhelmed by its beauty, but Jesus wasn't. Notice his response in verse 2. He answered and he said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Not one stone is going to remain. It's all going to be torn up. So what we're looking at today has been called the Olivet Discourse. And it, it deals with conditions prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. In the 260 chapters of the New Testament, Jesus' return is mentioned around 318 times. That means that one verse in every 25 specifically mentions the Lord's return. Out of the 27 New Testament books, only the books of Galatians and 2nd and 3rd John do not mention the second coming. Now, as Christians, the anticipation of being with Jesus is what fuels us. It's what is intended to direct our lives. This hope provokes us to be open and unashamed followers of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus said that he was going to return for us, and those who love him wait for him. In John 14, verses 2 and 3, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I will take you to be with myself. In my Father's house are many mansions. When you go to Israel, you have opportunities to go into various areas and receive um, not only Bible studies, but insights from the guides that are provided for us. And, and last time we went, one of the guides was speaking concerning a few things that I thought worthy of repetition here in our Bible study as I introduced this study. He had spoken concerning the fact that during the days of Christ and all, they, they had houses that would be built. The father would build the house, the father and the wife, they'd have their children. And at that time, the children were not going to move out necessarily. What they would do is they would build on the father's house a, an addition. And so there were different additions. And so if it was a large family, there'd be a large additions, uh, many additions. So when Jesus is speaking and he says, in my father's house are, are, are many dwelling places. In the King James, it says, in my father's house are many mansions. Well, we in the 20th, 21st century, what we did with that is we started thinking of mansions the way that you may think of when you watch TV and you see these mansions that that, that uh, American, the American rich live in. And that's not what the word means. The word mansion there is not speaking of, of these ornate palaces. It's speaking of homes, dwelling places. So in my father's house are many dwelling places of what Jesus was saying. And it would mean that the father would build a house. Actually, the husband built the house. They had children, he and his wife. And then they would build additions to that. And that would make a compound, a family compound. That's something that some of us are familiar with. Because when I grew up, my grandmother and my grandfather, my grandfather bought a couple of acres of land off of Pioneer Boulevard in Norwalk by the 5 Freeway. And um, they had a couple acres there. My, my, my grandfather built a house. He had a house that was about 600 square feet that he built with 13 children. Yeah, think about that for a minute. But anyway... About, it was tiny, a little house. And, but what they did is they built other homes. So we had a couple other homes there that were built for his children. And so that's the way at one time, even here in California, that's the way it was. The father had the house, they built the rooms, and the family would dwell in the same property. Well, it's that way in Israel during the time of Christ. And that's what Christ is speaking about. Jesus is speaking about the fact that his father has a house, but there are many dwelling places which speaks about the community of believers and how that we as believers ought to be looking forward to having that family lot, if you will, with the Father's house and all of us dwelling there alongside one another. That's why it's important for us as believers to understand there's no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. 
that when we were born again, we were brought by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. We are now one by one spirit have been brought into the one body. And it doesn't really matter if, if that, that portion of the body is called Calvary Chapel or if it's called the First Baptist Church or whatever. We're family. We belong together. And so Jesus is preparing that place for us. Now the anticipation of being with him, to being there at the Father's house with the community of believers enjoying the fellowship of the Lord, is what motivates us and, and causes us to be anticipating uh, being with him, to long to be with him. Because if he's returning, then that ought to provoke us a certain way of living. So the question is, if he's really returning, then are we ready for his return? You see, as Christians, we're to live expecting him to come at any time. Our lives obviously are to be different than those who don't believe that he's returning in 1 John 3, 2 and 3, it says it like this. John writes, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he's revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So we are preparing to be with him. Our lives are to be morally pure as we're awaiting the one to return who's going to take us to be with him. So if he's returning, then the question of the hour is really a basic. It's simple. How then should we live? If we believe that Christ is returning, what kind of life are we to be living? When we're to live a life of patient faith, expecting to be with Jesus at any time. Somebody wrote, the soon return of Jesus is the great Bible argument for a pure, unselfish, devoted, unworldly, and active life of service to him. If he's even at the door, if he's returning soon, how then should I live? Well, I live in a way that my life is ordered in, to be prepared for his return. In Luke 12, 39 and 40, it says it like this. Understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. He's going to come at that moment that you do not expect him. Now, here in this chapter, I want to lay a foundation before we begin looking at it verse by verse. Jesus is referring to the second coming. He is not specifically referring to the rapture of the church. We'll look at that probably in our series as we go through these chapters. What he's referring to is the second coming. One of my commentators said, the second coming of Christ is preceded by a number of world-shaking events that must occur before Jesus returns. This is in contrast to the rapture of the church which is always presented as an imminent event, something that will happen soon. The second coming is the closing of what God is doing with the world in order to prepare it for Jesus' millennial kingdom. The context of chapter 13 is speaking of his second coming. And the teaching is in response to a question that he was asked. Now, the question is, we'll see in just a moment, beginning at verse 3, as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? You see, Jesus in verse 2 had said, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. So there Jesus was ministering there, he was in the temple precincts, as we saw. He has given them a lesson on giving, using a widow who gave her gifts to the Lord as an example. As they're walking out and they're in the temple precincts, his disciples are overwhelmed with the beauty of this amazing temple, and they begin to call his attention to it. Well, Jesus makes a statement, everything's going to be destroyed. And as they're looking at this magnificent structure and everything around it, they begin to think, so they walk out of the gate and they head out across what is called the Brook Kidron. When you go to Israel, you'll go past that. We go past the Brook Kidron quite often. And you go up into a hill, the Mount of Olives, which is to the east. And so looking back, 
towards the gate and the temple, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And as he's speaking to his disciples, they're responding to what, what he had said. Because he's talking about its destruction, but in verse 4, they're asking, now, this is James, John, Andrew, and Peter, they're asking, tell us. Now notice, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? When and what? Jesus, as he gives his answer, gives the longest answer given in the New Testament to any question. And to understand the question, we need to understand their expectations. I want to develop this so you can get this context. During the time of Christ, there was a great deal of interest in prophetic events. The Jews were longing for Rome to be destroyed. They were longing for a deliverance uh, from Roman oppression and for the return of Messiah and his rule. For centuries, Israel had been subject to many foreign rulers. And you read your Bible, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Grecians, and now Rome had invaded and were dominating. So they longed to be free from the yoke of this pagan foreign tyranny. They knew scripture well enough to know that God had made promises to Israel that would include deliverance and a deliverer. The deliverer was a coming king. He would rule the nation righteously. We, we call him Messiah. In Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, it says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I'll raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. There are so many other uh, prophetic scriptures. I just wanted to touch on that one. So they knew that promises had been made. There is a future king coming. He will be the Messiah. He will rule in righteousness and justice. Well, during the time of Jesus, a set of expectations concerning Messiah had developed. They believed that before Messiah came, there would be a time of terrible tribulation. Then a forerunner like Elijah would be sent. After this, Messiah would appear and establish his kingdom. The unbelieving nations would join forces to fight Messiah. The nations opposing him would be destroyed for their opposition. Then Jerusalem would be restored. The Jews scattered throughout the earth would be gathered, regathered to Israel. Israel would be the center of the world. All nations would be subject to Messiah. And when Messiah began to rule, the world would enter eternal peace and joy. So that was their set of expectations. That was the common teaching concerning those things during the time of Christ. So that helps us understand the question that was asked by his men. They'd been influenced by the teachings, and, and uh, because those, those teachings at that time had been accepted, they believed that that's what was to take place. You see, the Old Testament prophets saw the coming of Messiah as a single event. At this time, they were yet to see that there's something that was later to be revealed called the church age. That was understood later, but not at that time. So to them, the events of Jesus' ministry had followed the course that they had expected. Israel was under severe tribulation. John the Baptist had presented Christ. Certainly, he's now about to establish his kingdom. So his disciples pointed out the beauty of the temple. In response, Jesus said that not one stone would be left upon another. It shall all be thrown down. Now, as they hear that, we need to understand that those words were actually literally fulfilled in A.D. under Titus of Rome. Josephus once again writes that Caesar gave orders that they should now demolish the whole city and temple except three towers and a part of the western wall. The western wall, by the way, continues to this day. It's been referred to as the Wailing Wall. And these were spared but all the rest of the wall was laid so completely even with the ground by those who dug it up to the foundation that there was left nothing to make those that came there believe that it had ever been inhabited. So in A.D. 70, it was demolished. And so when Jesus is saying that, it's, it's, it's shocking to them because they're looking at the beautiful buildings and the, the gold and everything, and then they're just in awe of how, how beautiful that building is. And Jesus says, no, it's going to be totally demolished. So he said that, and that's why in verse 3, uh, Peter, James, and 
Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked them that question, and they came to him privately to do so. They had crossed the Kidron, the city to the east of the temple, and they asked a question that can be divided into at least two parts, at least here in Mark. First notice, they ask, when will these things be? Again, they don't see the church age. You see, the thought, that, uh, the thought was that Messiah would establish his rule immediately. It's interesting, even after Jesus had been asked this question later on, it's asked again in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. It says, they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. You don't understand the times and the seasons. Those are in the Father's hands. You have a, a task. You're going to receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You're going to be filled with the presence of God. You're going to take a message to the world, and a new creation is going to occur called the church. After that point, there was Israel, and there were Gentiles. Humanity and Scripture is divided into two in the Old Testament. There's a, there's a nation of Israel, and then there are the Gentile nations. All the rest of the nations on the face of the earth are called Gentiles, the Goyim, the people of the nations. In the uh, Old Testament, there's Israel, God's people, and then there are the Gentiles, the nations. But in the New Testament, humanity is divided into three. There's Israel, there's Gentiles, there's the church made up of both Jew and Gentile. And you see that in the book of Ephesians very clearly. They are not aware of the, the baptism that's about to come. Jesus will give them more teaching concerning that, but the power of the Holy Spirit falling upon them. They're not aware of that at that time. They're not aware that God is going to take up the two, the Jew and Gentile, and make the new man, the one new man who's fashioned after the image of God. They don't know that. They don't know that the Gentiles are going to be brought into the promises that God gave to the nation of Israel. They don't know that yet. So what they're thinking is, are you about to do this? What's going to happen? We've seen some of the things that we were prepared for. We've seen them take place. We've been under that tribulation. We've seen John the Baptist and all of that. So this must be the time when you're going to take over as Messiah. Is that going to happen now? That's their question. When will these things be? But also they ask, what will be the sign? I want you to notice this. I'm going to develop this with you. What will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? What will be the sign? Notice how Jesus begins to answer them in verse 5. What does he say? Take heed that, you, that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am he, and will deceive many. I'm going to spend some time with you looking at this. What is the sign? You're going to notice in a moment, as we all know, he's going to speak of other things. But the question is answered in the singular, not the plural. He, they didn't say, what will be the signs? They said, what will be the sign? What is the primary sign that you're about to return, the second coming? What should we be aware of that indicates to us that everything's wrapping up? And what does he say? Notice what he says in verse 5. Take heed that no one deceives you. He says it again in verse 21 through 23. Notice, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, he's there. Do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive. If possible, even the elect take heed. See, I have told you all things beforehand. He repeats this. In Matthew, he does it uh, three to four times. He repeats this. Here in Mark, we see it repeated also. But what is the sign? Spiritual deception. Take heed. Now, when he says, take heed, this is something you have responsibility for, that I have responsibility for. Christians are to personally take care not to be deceived. I personally am to know Scripture well enough to guard myself against spiritual deception. You see, as time progresses, attacks on Christian faith will increase. And this is something we're to be aware of, and this is something that we must guard ourselves 
against spiritual deception. Deception is the method Satan uses to prepare the way for Antichrist. There will be attacks, and there have been attacks, on biblical inerrancy. Can I trust the Bible? The divine nature of Jesus. Oh, he's the second, he's the first creation of God. The resurrection of Jesus. Oh, he wasn't physically resurrected. He was only spiritually resurrected. And the return from Jesus. No, what he's talking about is that he's going to have his presence among people in church. I've heard these things over the years after I got saved. But there have been attacks on the literal fulfillment and description of all these things from the beginning. From the beginning, there was warnings given to the church that there were deceivers who were going to come in and do their best to bring deception in and undermine the hope of the believer. In the New Testament, deception is spoken of repeatedly and is a warning to believers. Let me give you a few examples. Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit expressly speaks that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, the apostle Peter writes, There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who secretly shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. John writes in 1 John 4, 1 through 3, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. In the book of Jude, verses 3 and 4, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who changed the grace of our God into a license for immorality and denied Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. The seeds of deception have been in the church since almost from the beginning. Paul is there in Miletus and he's having some final instructions that he's given to the elders of the church of Ephesus. And as he's meeting with them for the last time face to face because he's moving off into a time that he'll not see them again, he's ultimately going to die. He says, take heed. He says, the people are going to rise up from among you and even from yourself. Men will rise up and draw disciples after themselves. He warned and he warned and he warned. What is the number one sign? You see, a lot of times when we look at the last days, and we'll do this in just a moment, as we look at the other things that he speaks about, the wars and, and the nations rising against one another and the famines, plagues and things of that, of course, those are all things that we look at. But what is the sign? They said, what is the sign? They didn't say, what are the signs? They said, what is the sign? The number one thing, deception. False teachers creeping in, undermining who Jesus Christ is, denying the scriptures, denying that he's God in the flesh, denying that he's returning, denying the need for salvation through him and Jesus alone. All of that has been going from almost the time the church began to preach the gospel. The seeds of deception sown in the time of the apostles are still bearing fruit. Now, that will be especially true, as we've studied through the book of Revelation, that will be especially true during the tribulation. That's why it's so important for us in our day to read the Word of God. I want you to notice this again, please. Notice how Jesus, in verse 5, puts the personal responsibility on the hearer. Take heed that no one deceives you. That puts that responsibility on me. I can't blame my pastor Chuck. I can't blame another pastor. They may influence me in the wrong direction, but the warning is given to me on a personal level. You take heed that you are not deceived. How can I take heed that I'm not deceived? I need to be in the word of God myself. I need to have devotions. I need to read the scripture, pray through them. That's what I did long before I, God gave me the, the, the privilege of pastoring a church. I would go and buy books. 
And I would open up the Bible and I would read and I'd study for myself. I wanted to know what the word says. And when God gave me the ability to and the permission to and opened a door for me to begin teaching others, it became even more important then. This month, I celebrate my 49th anniversary of my first Bible study that I ever gave. 49 years. And so for 49 years, I've been dividing the word for 49 years to see what does it mean? How does this work? How do you apply this? What, what should I know? Take heed that you're not deceived. Spend time in the Word. Spend time praying. Say, God, what does this mean? And if you can't discover that, you do your best. You ask others who may know, and you grow. That's how it works. But that's my responsibility. You see, he speaks concerning deception. We're living in a time of spiritual deception right now. But not only that. In verse 7, he says, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. Well, again, keep it in context. He's speaking of the tribulation, seven years, and there are going to be a lot of wars and battles that are taking place and all of that. Uh, that's something that we, we are aware of during that period. But he's saying that that's going to increase in frequency and intensity as the end of the age nears. I was reading that it is estimated that out of our 5,000 or so years of history, that there has been 4,000 years of war. In our last century, in the 20th century, over 60 million people died in two world wars. 60 million. He says in verse 8 that nation will rise against nation and that kingdom against kingdom, again, we can see that this is already proceeding in that direction. I was reading this, this last week that since the year 2000, there have been no less than 53 wars, including the one in Ukraine. But what does he say? Notice verse 7. He says, do not be troubled, because this is all going to take place. This is setting up the return of Christ. These are just what he calls birth pangs, a time of sorrow. It's only the beginning. There's more to come. Now, as we see in Revelation, these conflicts lead to the final battle, the, the battle of Armageddon. Israel's enemies will attack the nation, but Jesus returns to establish his kingdom, and that Jesus defeats his enemies, and he casts the Antichrist and false prophet into the lake of fire. This is all awaiting them. It's still the future, but it's going to be taking place like just preparation. Notice in verse 8, he speaks of earthquakes and, and famines and troubles. Now, Matthew gives more information in Matthew 24, 6 and 7. You will hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in various places. There are people who want to use the current events to frighten you. And some people will go to church sometimes and come out really angry and frightened. I understand how that can take place when you begin to see all of the things taking place. And yet, I still remember as a new Christian, I wasn't more than three years old in Christ yet. I believe it was after I got out of the service and I was at home and I was staying at my parents' house at that time. There was a knock on the door and, and a Jehovah's Witness came and knocked on the door. I opened the door. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm a member of Jehovah's Witnesses. I said, oh, okay. And uh, can I share with you about current events? And I said, why not? No, I'm a, I'm a brand new Christian. It's not like I've been teaching a whole lot of Bibles yet. I, I was still learning. But when they were speaking to me, I'll never forget our conversation in that they said to me, they started reading about the wars, rumors of wars and pestilences and all of these things. And, 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 they, and they were trying to scare me with it. And I said, but wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say, when you see all of these things, look up for your redemption draws nigh? I said, why am I supposed to be afraid of these things? This is just closing our history and I'm going to be with the Lord. See, we're not supposed to be afraid of the return of Christ. We're supposed to anticipate the return of Christ with joy because he's returning for us. And yet we have so many people are so upset. These are things that ought to provoke us and awaken us that he's returning soon. 
We ought to be aware of those things. We ought to live as if we expect those things. He promised it. He said, I go and prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Aren't we living our lives in preparation for that moment to see him face to face? So why should I be afraid? I'm not afraid. I will be with my master. I will see him face to face. He has prepared a place for me. The family will have a reunion. We're going to have a great time, and I look forward to that. That's what Christians are supposed to do. Instead of running around saying, oh, I'm so scared. No. No. I look forward to it. Now, he speaks concerning these things, the earthquakes and famines and troubles. Why not look at that for a moment? Okay, we will. Earthquakes, seismic upheavals. Again, you read Revelation, you see what takes place there. Massive earth, earthquake and all. Well, the U.S. Geological Survey estimates several million earthquakes occur in the world each year. Many go undetected because they hit remote areas or have very small magnitudes. I have been teaching my church church services, not only here, but here in particular. I have taught here during earthquakes. Earthquakes are going on. I didn't feel it because this platform is actually only three or four inches thick of concrete. Underneath it, it's a dirt foundation. So it's very solid. But I, was, I still remember I was teaching a Bible study on a Sunday morning, and an earthquake hit. I didn't know an earthquake hit. I couldn't feel it. But I saw people's eyes getting like real big. And I turned and I looked in the screen like that, and the screen was moving. I thought, wow, we're having an earthquake. See, I'm, I'm, I'm born and raised in California, man. I've gone through, I go through them all the time. It's kind of, that's just us. You know, people, oh, I don't want to live in California. You know, I'm afraid of earthquakes. Good, just don't move here, please. Just don't move here. That's okay, fine. But other places have hurricanes and tornadoes and so you kind of get used to what you have, right? And so for us, we have earthquakes, and there are many of them. But there has been nearly a 2,000% increase of major earthquakes since 1900. So there are more earthquakes coming. Yes, the ability to be able to, uh, to have instruments that can let you know when has happened, that's all become more sophisticated. But earthquakes are increasing. And Jesus said that the earthquakes will continue. And that is taking place, and we see that. There are going to be famines. He speaks of famines. I was reading this. this I found interesting. The war in Ukraine has delivered a shock to global energy markets. Now the planet is facing a deeper crisis, a shortage of food, a crucial portion of the world's wheat Corn and barley is trapped in Russia and Ukraine because of the war, while even a larger portion of the world's fertilizers is stuck in Russia and Belarus. The result is that global food and fertilizer prices are soaring. Since the invasion, within a month, wheat price increased by 21%, barley by 33%, and some fertilizers by 40%. China, facing its worst wheat crop in decades after severe flooding, is planning to buy much more of the world's dwindling supply. And news reports have, that I've been reading recently, and it's been on the news on TV, uh, China is buying up a lot of America's farmland right now. We're selling America to people who want to destroy us for money. The greed is amazing to me. We're selling America to those who are making no bones about wanting to destroy us. And, and uh, that's taking place even as I'm reading this right now. Now, Matthew speaks of pestilence. That speaks of plagues. When you begin to read concerning worldwide uh, occurrences of, of, of pestilence, uh, malaria, tuberculosis, pneumonia, even measles continue producing deaths. Many years ago, in the 80s, a new disease, a new virus was discovered. I wonder how many in this room remember what it originally was referred to 
I'm speaking of HIV AIDS. And I, I by the way, don't say this with any kind of um, uh, meanness in my heart, because frankly, uh, I, I have performed uh, funerals for those who, who died of AIDS. But when AIDS came out, we didn't know how AIDS was being transmitted. Some of you may remember that. We didn't know how it was being transmitted. There were books that were being written. This is in the, in the mid-80s. There were books being written, but much of the material you were getting at that time was confusing. There were those who were pointing out and saying, you can get AIDS if you, if you kiss. There were those who were saying, you can get AIDS if you um, uh, sit on a toilet seat. There were those who were saying you could get AIDS if someone coughs on you. There were, it was much like the COVID thing. There were people who were saying things, but not everybody knew exactly what was taking place. And, and so this is, we're talking about in the 80s. But I wonder, all of us have heard of HIV AIDS, right? How many of you have heard of GRIDS? I really want to know. Could you raise your hand? GRIDS. Okay. Do you know that GRIDS is what HIV AIDS was at one time called? Did you know that? That GRID... Gay-related immunodeficiency syndrome. That's what it was called. GRIDS. Why was it called GRIDS? Gay-related. It's like monkeypox today. They don't want to tell you how it's being transmitted. Why? Because it's politically incorrect to actually point to the source. The way when COVID came, they didn't want to say it came from China. Even though I have two, uh, an uncle and an aunt who died from the Spanish flu, I guess I should be upset because they use the word Spanish. It makes no sense. It's just the origin. This is where it came from. That makes sense to me. But what we ended up with is people who didn't want to use the word grids because it wasn't politically correct. We're talking about 85, 84. It's already been implanted in our society, not to point out the obvious, because you're either racist or you're homophobic. And th but that was just what it was. It's simply saying this is how it's being transmitted. This helps us to understand how to bring it under control. But because of the lobbying, it was changed to acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, HIV AIDS. That's how it came about. Some of you didn't know, but that's how it came about. So we didn't know what was going on with that particular plague. We didn't know. There was so much information that was convoluted, we didn't know. So we don't know how it's being communicated. We don't know much about it at all. It was pretty much hidden in many ways. At that time, I received a phone call. A woman in our fellowship, my husband is in the hospital. Can you visit him? Well, of course. So we go to the hospital to go and pay a hospital visitation. I still remember going to the hospital, standing outside in this particular this uh, block of the hospital, and I'm standing outside looking through glass at a man who has his, his he had IVs, he had a mask over his face. It, 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 there was just all kinds of things going on. As I'm looking at him, and I'm wondering, what does he have? Then I see the nurse in attendance. She was wearing one of those space suits that they have. And uh, she's caring for him. And, but I look at the wife, and the wife was a nurse, and the wife is wearing just regular civilian clothes, if you will, just dressed normally. And she's not wearing it, but this other person is wearing it. And, you know, it doesn't take long for my mind to finally lock in. This guy doesn't just have a cold. Something's wrong here that's pretty bad. So, AIDS, AIDS. Now, I remember standing there looking, and I had my assistant with me at the time, and I'm looking in this room. And here comes the nurse, and she walks out, and she speaks to me, and she says, can I help you? I said, yes, I'm his pastor. I'm here to pray for him. She says, you're going to have to gown up. and do I, not, But I'm looking at the wife, and she's not gowned up. And I said, no. I said, no, I'm going to go in as I am. She says, you need to gown. I said, no, I'm going in there as I am. I didn't want to insult the wife. And so I turned to my assistant and I said to him, we don't know how this disease is being transmitted. You need to stay out and I'm going to go in. You stay out. 
And he says, no. He says, I'm going to go in. So I said, okay, then I'll stay out. <laughs> no. <laughs> One of us got to. So we both went in. And the man was, like I said, hooked up. And when he saw me, he motioned to his wife with his hand. I'll always remember this. And he asked her for a pad and a pen, writing tablet and a pen. And he wrote this note. And she peeled it off and handed it to me. And I'll never forget. She wrote, it, it, it said, I am eternally grateful to you. Why? Because I was there visiting him? No. Because before he died, because of the ministry of the word of God, because of this fellowship, we gave him the gospel. He died three days later of AIDS. But he went to heaven because he gave his heart to Christ. And that's, that's one of the reasons why, when you hear me sharing with you, that's one of the reasons why I tell you, teaching the word of God is what saves people's souls. That's why we teach God's word. You could be happy because we had exciting worship. You could be happy because I bounce around up here and get you all agitated, which isn't hard to do. Or you can be blessed because God's word is resting in your soul, giving you eternal comfort for the day that you meet Jesus Christ. You can say, my name is in your book. And that comes from the word of God. You see, so we're living in times that we're familiar with that are only going to escalate. The obvious plague that we're dealing with right now is COVID. As of September 1st, there have been 608,366,000 452 confirmed cases, but there have been 6,496,975 reported deaths. Pestilences are things that we are, as a people, familiar with. It's only going to rise in the last days, in the time just prior to Jesus returning. Now notice again, Jesus makes a statement, verse 8, and we'll close with this. These are the beginnings of sorrows. These are the beginnings of birth pangs. The word sorrows refers to birth pangs. It's starting. Now birth pangs are, are what take place, obviously. Every woman who's given birth knows this very well, just before the baby's born. These are the things that are going to take place just before Jesus returns, is what he's saying. The disasters that we see in our day are previews of things to come. The things that we see now are foretastes of the tribulation. And these things should be increasing our faith. And what we're seeing will give us a deeper certainty of what happens in the end. And it serves to encourage us to continue sharing our faith with other people. Hebrews 2 verse 3 says it like this. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by those who heard him, how shall we escape without God's word? And as God's word is presented and we hold fast to it, we are not afraid. We look up for our redemption is drawn nigh and we share with people the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they can have peace and they can have hope and they can have love and they can with anticipation expect to see Jesus Christ soon. And when we see him, we will not regret a single thing that we left behind. All we'll be able to do at that time when we see him is just to praise him and thank him for all he did for us and that we can be there in this great reunion for in his house are many mansions and our families there to greet us. We see Jesus Christ. What else would be better than that? And so Jesus speaks concerning that to us. And as we go through this together, we will be seeing more and more as we go through the 13th chapter of the book of Mark. And Father, we ask that you would...